Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, and I'll call on Susan Barrett. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everybody. A couple of uh, public comment periods that I want to remind folks about that are open right now. Um, we currently have an open public comment period on the uh, state's Vermont State of Vermont Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan, as well as connectivity criteria. We heard a presentation on that plan last week, and the public comment is open through November 25th. We also have a public comment period on the One Care Vermont ACO's FY22 budget uh, submission and uh, certification. And that uh, public comment period is open by, um, until, excuse me, um, December 1 to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board staff presentation on December 8 or by December 17th to be considered ahead of a potential Green Mountain Care Board vote, which is tentatively scheduled for December 22nd. And uh, just as a reminder, we do not meet this Wednesday. And I just wanted to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving this week. And also that our schedule uh, for our board meeting for next month, for the month of December, will be posted uh, later on this week, likely on Wednesday. And that is all I have to report. I can turn it back to Chair Mellon. Thank you, Susan. Next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, 11-17. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, 11-17, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was a, a unanimous but quiet vote. So at this point, um, we're going to turn the discussion to the 2021 um, ACO financial um, settlement and quality uh, performance. And to tee everything up and to introduce the panelists for today, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Degree and Sarah Kensler. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, I will share my slides in just a moment, but what I'll do is likely ask each of the presenters to just introduce themselves at the start of their slide deck. I think that would be the easiest way to kind of go through this. So it's one deck all together, but we've got pretty nice transitions in there if I do say so myself. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, kind of have everyone introduce themselves as their payer program comes up into rotation. Um, I will just note, I hope that this year we make it through. If you might recall, last year we broke teams and the board meeting never ended for about a week. So let's see how, how we do this year. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and if you could all just let me know when you're, give me a thumbs up or something, if you're able to see it. We can see it. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna turn off my camera. Um, so thank you. Uh, and again, today, I will just make one correction to what you stated, Chair Mullen. This is the 2020 financial settlement and quality performance, not 2021. Um, so today we're talking about the results for the ACO's payer program contracts in 2020. Um, and again, as stated, I'm joined by representatives of Medicaid, MVP, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, who will again introduce themselves sort of at the beginning of their slides. Um, as in years past, Sarah Lindberg and myself will represent Medicare uh, during the discussion today. Uh, so quick agenda, we'll go through a few background slides that I have for you and then we'll go right into the results um, and then we'll turn it over to the board for questions and public comments. So again, just a couple of reminders. Today's a review of 2020 performance, although we are actively reviewing the 2020 to proposed budget, um, always in a couple of different years here. So the um, today's kind of discussion is relative 
uh, to the board's ACO oversight authority. Uh, the quality performance discussed today is a reflection of the ACO's performance relative to its payer contracts and does not necessarily refre reflect the ACO's contribution to the state's performance within the all payer ACO model agreement. Um, so the for the purposes of agreement reporting, the 2020 quality report for those 22 measures specified in the agreement uh, is anticipated to be released early in 2020. Um, just as another reminder, claims-based measurement does take time. We're currently waiting for some final run out to be able to start running um, several of the measures required for the purposes of the agreement. Um, and just another highlight that today is not an evaluation of the all pair model itself. To evaluate the APM, again, we produce those annual financial and quality reports. And the NORC has done some work and presented to the board already and will continue to do so. Um, I believe the next report isn't for another couple of years, but that is something that's still um, on deck for them. Just another couple of reminders. Under the agreement, the ACO is a legal organization of healthcare providers that agrees to be accountable for the quality, cost, and overall care of beneficiaries assigned to it. The ACO's scale target qualifying programs must reasonably align in their designs across payers, which includes the ACO payer quality measures. So these measures, while certainly related, are separate and distinct from the state's performance under the all payer model. And everyone's favorite. <laughs> so here's where what we're looking at in 2020. Um, the alignment here. So of course we have the APM is the first column there, and I know this is probably kind of small. It's getting harder and harder to fit on one slide. Um, and then across each of the participating pairs. So you have the all pair model uh, measures first. Then you have the Medicaid Next Generation Program, the Medicare Initiative, Blue Cross, and MVP. Uh, some measures, just to note, uh, specifically initiation and engagement measure, we report separately for the purposes of the model, but our commercial payers do combine those into one rate um, as acceptable by HEDIS reporting. It's just something that we do separately uh, for the purposes of the model. Pair program comparison, I always just like to make this note. So there's uh, many similarities realized across the, the programs, especially beginning in 2019, given the ability that the state had to recommend design changes to the Medicare initiative in that year. As you'll recall, throughout 2018, the GMCB, One Care, and the HCA had an extensive um, process where we negotiated which measures we'd like to see in the Medicare participation agreement. Um, and so per the agreement language, those measures for 2019 to 2022 are in sort of more direct alignment with other ACO payer programs in operation. The differences that do remain are primarily due to types of covered lives. So for a pretty straightforward example, adolescent measures for commercial and Medicaid, but not for Medicare, just makes sense based on their covered populations. Couple of considerations I just wanna highlight before we get into the individual payers. Um, while we do now have three points in time, uh, comparability is still a challenge given several factors. So um, I've kind of highlighted these out for you. So in performance year one, 2018, the Medicare program followed the shared savings program, quality metrics specifically. So that is a little harder to compare to the, the next few years. So in performance year two, the Medicare program changed again per those negotiations. And there was the introduction of the Medicaid expanded attribution cohort. In performance year three, of course, we had COVID-19, the public health emergency, which I believe every pair will touch on today. We had the introduction of the MVP program and we had further expansion in that Medicaid program. Um, another thing just to highlight is, is scale growth, right? So from 2018 to 2020, I've laid out sort of the attributed lives there for you and, and this is how we present it for our scale report. So Medicaid and Medicare are direct from uh, prospective attribution. The commercial is as of January 1 of that year, um, just to sort of show you that growth. So I did some quick math just before because I thought 
somebody might ask me for percent change. So from 2018 to 2020, we saw 164% growth in the Medicaid program, 46% in the Medicare program, and 105% in the commercial program. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to start by turning it over to Sarah Lindbergh for a discussion on Medicare financial settlement, and then I will discuss quality before we turn it over to the rest of the panel. Sarah, are you here? I just don't see you on my screen. I'm here. Thank I'm you. Here. <laughs> yep, there you go. All right. So um, just uh, we'll start here by talking about uh, individuals. So the way that the Medicare uh, ACO program is set up is that there are a set of people who are prospectively aligned and they might attrit off the ACO program during the course of the year because they either don't retain both parts A and B of their coverage uh, or they sign up for Medicare Advantage or they end up receiving the majority of their care outside of the ACO's uh, service area for their primary care. So as you can see, the number of beneficiaries included at the time of settlement is lower than the um, prospectively aligned population. And the difference there was bigger in 2020 than it was in the previous year, and that's due with, uh, almost entirely due to the increasing take-up of Medicare Advantage. So as the Medicare Advantage penetration rate increases, those still in the Medicare fee-for-service traditional Medicare decreases. And so as soon as they sign up for that program, they are taken off the roster for the year. Um, we also include people who do die along the way as long as they were eligible up until the point they passed away. So going to the next slide, please. You can see the financial settlement in 2020. Uh, sorry for the small font, uh, but essentially the large block up there is what the prospective benchmark initially was set at. And then we have the benchmark as it was updated at the time of settlement. Due to the public health emergency, uh, we ended up using a retrospective trend factor. You might have a vague memory of me coming before you in the uh, in the early or late spring uh, to about that change, but we decided because there was so much uncertainty that we should actually use a retrospective trend factor, which means that this um, prospective benchmark wasn't actually finalized until about July of this year, and that was kind of a nod to the you know unprecedented uncertainty that we dealt with this year. So uh, on a per member per month basis, uh, the ACO lives were $700. And as you can see, that's broken up into the aged and disabled, that's what A and D stands for, and an ESRD or end stage renal disease population. So again, not a lot of people um, in that ESRD group, but they have a much uh, more substantial per member per month cost. So uh, the quality adjustment could have gone down by up to $1.9 million, uh, but the ACO reported all the measures it was required to, and so there was no quality withhold for 2020, which meant that their gross savings and loss was uh, just over $27 million. However, um, the savings and loss is capped at a 5% corridor, so the maximum savings possible was $20.4 million. And so uh, after you take... 80% of that, which is the risk uh, mechanism that the ACO selected within that 5% corridor, they ended up with a total net savings of $16.3 million. However, if you look back at line four or line two, you can see that 8.4 million of that was advanced uh, to help with cash flow for funding the Blueprint for Health and SASH programs. So the uh, net check to the ACO at the end of the year was 7.9 million. So if you wanna go to the next slide, please. So um, financial performance, this is just looking at the actual um, care. We're taking the blueprint advanced savings out of the equation and just looking at what the performance target was compared with the ACO expenditures. So uh, in 2018, uh, they were 13.9 million below the target. So that's what they saved. They were a little bit over their target in 2019. So the 2.4 was over their performance target. And it's, it's hard to call 2020 performance, but what happened in 2020 was that they, um, again, had that $27 million below the expected target. 
And so Michelle, um, here's where we get into all the fun math of settlement. So um, each year shows what the gross savings or loss was, applies a cap to that on the second line. And then you can see which is the um, maximum um, allowable between uh, um, those two lines. So if the savings is under the cap, it's the first row. If the savings is above the cap, it's the second row. Um, you can see the quality adjust adjustments there. So 2018 was another um, just reporting year. So there was no quality deduction that year. But in 2019, there was just under $200,000 de deducted for quality. Um, below that is that risk arrangement within the corridor selected by the ACO, which is how we get to our adjusted capped savings or loss. Um, we also had a little bit of um, weirdness that happened in 2018 because the sequestration that Medicare required at the time was not applied prospectively, so it had to be added at settlement. Um, and then finally, we see the advanced shared savings that, again, is for cash flow to help fund the blueprint and the SASH programs. And then we get the net settlement after we adjust for the advanced savings each year. So in 2018, it was a check in favor of the ACO for 6.2 million. In 2019, it was 4.9 million. And again, this year it was 3.9 million. Um, so I th think that was what I had to present for you today. So I'll send it back over to Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. So we'll turn now into 2020 quality performance for the Medicare program. Um, so as in years past, so just like 2019, there are four domains. There's patient caregiver experience, care coordination and patient safety, preventive health, and the at-risk population. I've listed here sort of the possible points, but again, due to the public health emergency, all measures were reverted to pay for reporting in 2020, which resulted in a 100% score for One Care Vermont. Uh, this, I would like to just note, is not specific to One Care. This was a national decision. All ACOs were in the same boat. Um, specifically um, for the first domain there, you'll see that uh, the CAP surveys, so the ones for ACOs specifically, were not collected at all in 2020 due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, again, so some more considerations. Uh, we did calculate the ACO score using the pre-COVID points rubric uh, based on the raw score for each measure using this rubric, the ACO would have scored a 96.25%. So again, CAP surveys not administered. So we left that score at 100% for performance year 2020. And a really big one, the care coordination and patient safety score reflects the score for two claims-based measures that are related to readmissions. Uh, they're listed there for you. So ACO 8, risk standardized, all condition readmission, and ACO 38, which is all cause unplanned admissions for patients with multiple chronic conditions. The ACO performed significantly better on these measures in, 20, in performance year 2020 than in previous years. Um, it's hypothesized the increase in performance is due to the changes made to the methodology. Because of these concerns, uh, it's so it says we do not feel, but um, oh, Lewin, who's CMMI's federal contractor, um, and and the GMCB have had conversations around this. So, whoops, oh boy, there we go. Uh, because of these concerns, we don't feel comparing the results to previous years is valid. So you will see that on the next. In a couple of slides, I have not made that comparison. You certainly could go back and look at prior years, but it is um, sort of against what we would suggest doing in this case. Um, and just as, as an FYI, in performance year 2020, this is sort of thinking a little bit forward thinking for some of the other measures that we'll look at for the purposes of the all pair model reporting. There were a lot of methodological changes at the national level this past year. So we'll, this is sort of a recurring theme just to give you a, a primer for something you might see uh, coming in the future. So again, a review of past performance, performance year one, 2018, 82.4%, paper reporting only, the ACO did earn a 100% score. Again, that was the shared savings program measure set, which had significantly more measures than the performance year two and three. 
Um, performance year two, 2019, the ACO scored 91.88%. And then performance year three, again, 96.25, but a 100% score was earned by the ACO. With that, here are the 2020 Medicare results. Uh, where applicable, I've included the 2019 rate. So again, for those first two, as I discussed with those methodological changes, I've not included it on this slide. Um, and you can see um, across the board, you know, the increases were realized in uh, some influenza immunization, uh, follow up after discharge for alcohol or other drug uh, abuse, and then initiation of alcohol and drug dependence treatment. There are some drops here uh, between the two rates. However, I will say that if you do a comparison, and I can walk through some of these if there are questions, but some of the denominators or utilization in some of these were, were significantly different between the two performance years. So something to keep in mind as we're looking sort of through this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Medicaid. So I believe I have uh, Amy Kunrat and Alicia Cooper, who I will ask to introduce themselves and just let me know when you'd like me to advance your slide. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Amy Kunrad. I'm the Director of Operations for ACO Programs uh, with the Department of Vermont Health Access. I'm also joined by my colleague, Alicia Cooper, who is the Director of Managed Care Operations at the Department of Vermont Health Access. And we will be walking through the VMNG Program's 2020 performance. Next slide, please. To begin with, we thought it would be helpful to frame the VMNG program in the context of DIVA's priorities as a payer. Um, there are three priority areas on this slide that the department has. Um, one is related to value-based payment, of which this model is a keystone, and another is related to performance. And by implementing the VMNG program, we are able to focus on Medicaid being a predictable and reliable payer partner. Um, and are able to focus on continual and incremental programmatic improvements as we make changes to the program year over year. Um, and additionally, the program gives us opportunities to align with other similar payer programs and to be an innovative leader and come up with some ideas that other payer programs might want to align with in future. Next slide, please. The VMNG contract uh, was originally if you recall, for a one-year agreement in 2017 with four optional one-year extensions. DIVA and the ACO, OneCare, have executed one-year extensions for 2018 through 2021. Um, because the population of attributed members changes a little bit year over year, rates for the program are renegotiated annually and reconciliation for the program occurs annually, but it could occur more frequently than that. Um, because the VMNG contract, the original one, is set to expire at the end of the 2021 performance year, um, in the spring of 2021, DIVA um, put together and issued an RFP to continue contracting for ACO services for a 2022 performance year, and One Care Vermont was the apparently successful bidder in this process. Um, currently, DIVA and One Care are actively in negotiations for a one-year contract with three optional one-year extensions with an anticipated start date of January 1st, 2022. Thanks. <clears throat> um, before we go ahead and summarize the program's performance for 2020, we wanted to provide a summary of adjustments made to the VMNG contract to account for the impacts of COVID-19 during the 2020 performance year. As we have all seen, the COVID-19 pandemic and associated public health emergency impacted Vermont's healthcare system significantly. And this also includes impacting the ACO's financial and quality performance in the VMNG program. Um, as Michelle noted, in alignment with adjustments made to ACO programs at the federal level, uh, DIVA modified certain of its contractual provisions to hold providers harmless for COVID-19 related impacts on cost, quality, and utilization during the 2020 performance year. These adjustments included making 2020 a pay for reporting year on the VMNG quality measure set, decreasing the downside of the risk corridor proportionally to the proportion of months in 2020 that were in an active federal public health emergency. And since the federal public health emergency was declared in January of 2021, 
It resulted in a downside risk corridor reduction to 0% since there was an active public health emergency in all 12 months of 2020. It also included removing COVID-19 episodes of care from the calculations of the ACO's total cost of care since the rates for the expected total cost of care for 2020 were developed using 2019 experience and therefore did not include, co I'm sorry, using 2018 experience and therefore did not include COVID-19 related spend. And we will now move into the VMNG 2020 financial and quality performance. So this slide shows the size of the VMNG program for each of its performance years, 2017 through going to be 2022. Um, in 2017 through 2020, the VMNG program saw an increase in participation year over year in terms of the numbers of communities and providers participating, and therefore also an increase in attribution as a result of that. 2020 was also the first year that DIVA implemented an expanded attribution methodology which in addition to the members who were attributed by nature of their relationship to a PCP, the participating in One Care Vermont, we would attribute um, members who are eligible for Medicaid, don't have another form of insurance, and don't have a relationship with a PCP that's not participating in One Care. So that's our expanded cohort. Um, as, oh, okay, something funky happened there. Sorry about that. <clears throat> So after that, we see that provider and community participation and therefore attribution have remained pretty stable between the 2020 performance year and what will be the 2022 performance year. Um, just as a note, attribution for the 2022 performance year was set on November 1st of this year. So there are those numbers for the 2022 performance year, which we're debuting for the first time. Um, I'll, I'll now turn it over to Alicia Cooper to discuss some of the financial results in more detail. Thank you, Amy. Go to the next slide. So I'm sure this slide will look familiar to folks who have seen our presentation on this subject in prior years. Uh, just as a brief refresher, uh, Diva and OneCare set an agreed upon price for each contract year of the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program and we structure our risk arrangement around that agreed upon price. And just so that we have kind of an orientation to everything that we'll be looking at in the graphics that follow, I'll briefly walk through what's here. Um, we can see that the green bar represents 100% of the total agreed upon price, and the blue line is equivalent to that 100%. We then set a risk corridor around 100%. And in this example, we're using a, a plus, or four, plus or minus 4% risk corridor as indicated by the dashed red and green lines. And you can see that we have sort of a corresponding explanation for each um, scenario of performance around this risk corridor. Um, if the ACO's financial performance is within the risk corridor, but above the agreed upon price, so in this instance between 100 and 104 percent, the ACO network bears full accountability for financial performance within that range. This is creating an incentive for the providers that are participating to moderate costs and stay as close as possible to that agreed upon price. If the actual cost of care is beyond 104% of that agreed upon price or outside the risk corridor, DIVA will again bear full accountability for this financial performance. Um, this protects against anything sort of catastrophic happening during the year and allows providers to start changing the way that they're delivering care without um, fear of significant financial loss from the risk arrangement. On the flip side, if we think about within the risk corridor, but below 100% of the agreed upon price, um, between 96% and 100%, the ACO network of providers is entitled to retain the entire difference. Um, this creates an incentive to be efficient within the risk corridor and the total agreed upon price. 
And then if performance is below the risk corridor, below 96% threshold in this scenario, um, the remaining portion that is below the risk corridor accrues to DIVA in terms of um, dollars not spent on healthcare services. And this creates an incentive to continue spending money on care and not to ration services um, within the, the risk construct. So with that to frame our understanding, we can go to the next slide. At a high level, uh, we looked at financial performance for two separate cohorts of attributed Medicaid members in 2020. Uh, as Amy mentioned, 2020 was our first year implementing our broader expanded attribution methodology. And so we had one cohort of members that was consistent with how we have looked at attribution historically, 2017 through present, and then the new cohort of attributed members that we call the expanded attribution cohort, um, for which we looked at financial performance separately. The reason that we separated them out was because by definition, um, many of these members have um, fewer claims historically that we can use to make informed decisions about uh, sort of setting that agreed upon price and we had less certainty about what their actual utilization might look like during the performance year. So the risk corridor was more narrow for that new attribution cohort. So we'll show the results graphically for the two um, as we go further on. But overall, um, Spending for the traditionally attributed cohort was approximately $11.6 million less than expected on a total cost of care of $260 million for that group, and approximately $5.2 million less than expected for the expanded attribution cohort, uh, where the expected total cost of care was approximately $61 million. OneCare, as I mentioned, is entitled to the full amount of funding below the agreed upon price and within the risk corridors. So when we look at this financial performance and we apply other necessary adjustments as part of our reconciliation calculations, DIVA will issue a reconciliation payment of approximately $15.4 million to OneCare for the combined performance in those two cohorts. Next slide, please. And here we have the same results presented more graphically. Uh, again, this should look somewhat familiar as we have tried to use this format to share the financial results in prior years. On the left side of the figure, you can see the performance for the traditional attribution cohort. Um, to orient folks to this particular graphic, we have the portion of the spending that was paid prospectively illustrated in yellow, and the portion that was paid on a fee-for-service basis illustrated in that orange color. And then the gray block represents the spending underneath the agreed upon price. As we saw in the earlier graphic, the red, green, and blue bars indicate the actual agreed upon price and then the risk corridor around it. Um, Amy noted on her portion of the presentation that because of the COVID-19 provisions in our contract, the downside risk in the agreement was eliminated. So the red dashed line here is more illustrative of what was originally envisioned, but there was technically um, no risk above 100% of the agreed upon price after incorporating those adjustments to our contract. And that's noted with the asterisk at the bottom of the slide. So we can see for both of the cohorts, um, we had the green dashed line representing that lower bound of the risk corridor within the gray section of um, dollars that um, was underneath the agreed upon price. That means that the financial performance for both of these cohorts was below the risk corridor. So OneCare is entitled to retain for both of these cohorts, essentially the difference between the blue line and the green dashed line. Um, you can see that just visually the cost of care for the expanded attribution cohort was quite a bit smaller. 
um, and the risk corridor, as I mentioned, was narrower for this particular cohort because of some of those additional uncertainties in how we would approach the rate development process. But other than that, the, the mechanics worked the same for the expanded attribution cohort as they did for the traditional cohort when thinking about the comparison of the expected and the actual total cost of care. Next slide, please. This slide is the same construct as we just looked at, but showing our year over year performance since 2017. Um, as Amy mentioned, we've had growth in the size of our attributed population year over year since the beginning of our program. And really you can think of those last two columns together as the, the full population for 2020. So quite a bit more growth beyond what we had in 2019 by introducing the expanded attribution methodology. And this is more just for a visual reference so that you can see year over year how the financial performance has compared to the risk corridors that we have established for the agreement. Next slide, please. We wanted to take a moment to reinforce um, what we think of as the important role of the prospective payments in the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program in creating stability during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, as we observed uh, across the system, there were significant decreases in utilization of healthcare services during 2020, particularly during the period of system shutdown, but also as services were slower to resume once the system reopened. As providers were seeing revenue decrease for elective visits and procedures during the pandemic, providers who were receiving fixed prospective payments as part of the VMNG program were better, better able to withstand the loss of fee-for-service revenue from non-Medicaid lines of business. And we think that this really underscores the importance of revenue predictability for providers as Vermont looks at increasing particip participation in this type of population-based payment model. We'll also note that the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen reconciliation payments that will be going to OneCare for the 2020 performance year will allow for additional resources to be directed to the healthcare system as the COVID-19 related pressures continue. Um, we're not in that active period of system shutdown anymore, but we know that the effects of COVID-19 are certainly lingering as we think about challenges relating to uh, cases currently and staffing difficulties. And so we think that this additional element of the reconciliation process is also an important part of the COVID-19 response from the Medicaid perspective. Next slide, please. And here I'll turn it back over to Amy. Thanks, Alicia. So here on this slide, which is also difficult to read as our quality measurement slides seem to be always, um, here is the quality measure performance for the VMNG program in 2020. Um, the columns that look orangey or yellowy are the rates and the numerators and denominators for that traditional attribution cohort. And the greenish columns are the numerators, denominators, and rates for that expanded attribution cohort. And we also have included the 2019 rate um, for reference, which is, I think, comparable only to the traditional attribution cohort. <clears throat> As we mentioned, um, it was reporting year only for 2020. So the maximum number of points that the ACO could have gotten was 20. They have received. Um, this was done in order to hold the providers harmless for the impacts of COVID-19 on utilization. Um, reporting for the expanded attribution cohort was uh, for claims-based measures only, since some of the clinical measures um, require <laughs> chart pulls at providers' offices, and the expanded attribution didn't doesn't necessarily have a relationship with the primary care provider, so it would have been difficult to try and produce a hybrid measure sample for that population. So the expanded attribution cohort only has um, results for claims-based measures here. 
um, as we have said, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has pretty, pretty significantly impacted utilization. And during 2020, it had a particular impact in decreasing outpatient utilization significantly for a portion of the year. Um, the majority of the measures in the VMNG measure set here are process related measures usually done in an outpatient setting. And so the performance for 2020 generally was negatively impacted by the pandemic related decrease in utilization. Um, rates decreased for the majority of the measures for the traditional attribution cohort between 2019 and 2020 as a result of this. Um, as Michelle had said earlier, I would also caution against comparing the 2019 and 2020 results, both because the 2019 and 2020 traditional cohorts are slightly different. There is some overlap, but there are differences between the two. And also because of the pandemic, I, I think that had a negative enough impact where comparisons between the two might not, I don't know, necessarily be that insightful. Um, I'll also note that this was the first year that OneCare had an expanded attribution cohort, which has a different historic set of utilization patterns if they had historic utilization at all. Some of the expanded attribution cohort is uh, new to Medicaid and might not have had historic utilization and might also not have had any uh, or little utilization during the performance year as well. Um, so performance on quality for this cohort is also likely to be different than performance for the traditional attribution cohort. Um, and now I will turn it back over to Alicia to talk a little bit more about future direction. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so we are concluding at this point in time our 2021 performance year. Uh, DIVA remains committed to testing the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO model and a new contract um, as being negotiated presently will allow performance to continue into 2022. Uh, we look forward to working with OneCare and providers to restore risk sharing and quality provisions to pre-COVID levels in subsequent performance periods. Diva is also interested in continuing to use this model to innovate. Um, we think that we've made some important developments in our attribution methodology by introducing the expanded approach to attribution and we expect there will be continued opportunities to refine this as we learn more about the dynamics of that expanded attribution cohort uh, in more normal years than 2020. We think there are also opportunities to consider additional types of provider organizations that could be paid prospectively in future years and we look forward to exploring potential modifications to the rate development methodology to allow for better year over year predictability, recognizing some of what we have seen in terms of volatility and fee for service utilization uh, from one program year to the next. And with that, we will conclude our portion. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and next we have Blue Cross and I see Andrew just popped up on my screen. So Andrew, uh, just let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. Bye. Thanks, Michelle. I think we can jump to the first content slide. Um, while we're doing that, uh, for those who I have not met before, I'm Andrew Garland. I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, been working on payment reform, healthcare reform in, in one form or another since uh, 2008, and uh, I've been working on the uh, on the all-payer model uh, since uh, a few years before it went live. Uh, so I thought uh, to begin with, and I, I won't spend a tremendous amount of time on this, but I, as a reference uh, for everyone involved, um, I just put up the list of principles that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has um, considered and uh, that we bring to the table anytime we're thinking about this program uh, and um, how to evaluate both the structure and the performance. This, this is our checklist um, for, for what is really important to our members and uh, ratepayers. And I, I won't go down through the whole list now and inventory them, but, but suffice it to say that um, the structure of our model with OneCare is really uh, hitting uh, green on, on pretty much all of these principles and um, what remains for us to prove out uh, as we work together is that we can really uh, generate results from that structure. 
but in, in principle, uh, we're doing really well. So let's jump to the next slide, Michelle. And I'll talk about some things that are going really well uh, between Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and OneCare uh, as we work together and some challenges for us. Michelle, can you advance to the next slide, please? It's on the next slide on my screen. It's on bright spots and challenges. Oh, okay, mine did not update for some reason. Let me shift over. I have my own version here. Yeah, so uh, bright spots, the first two bullets really to tell us that uh, our teams are working very well together um, and there's a tremendous amount of work going on. Um, we have folks on our clinical team, quality team, actuarial team, analytic team, all interfacing with uh, one care, what the one care team regularly. And that, that collaborative approach has really allowed us to continue to work well and be responsive in the face of, of COVID-19. We've made some pretty dramatic um, changes to our program uh, to help our providers and the market um, respond uh, and continue to have faith in this program as we work through um, the rest of the pandemic. And, and that really is born out of that collaboration. Uh, as you, some of you may know, we have a hospital fixed perspective payment pilot. It's not <laughs> nearly as broad in scale as, as Medicaid, uh, but we are uh, now more than a year into that. And, and we've learned uh, quite a lot about uh, the operations in particular, you know, what it takes uh, to make that kind of payment uh, work in, in, a, in a, a claims processing system that was really designed uh, for a fee-for-service. Uh, so that's, that's been really positive. I mentioned this last year because uh, we were just rounding, rounding it out as we got together for this talk last year, but we worked together with OneCare to uh, pilot an entirely new approach to quality measurement for 2021. That's based on a work plan instead of a scorecard. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, um, but I think that was extremely successful uh, experiment uh, so far. And we're, we're going to learn a lot from that as well. And then uh, finally, going all the way back to the beginning, you saw that large uptick in uh, membership on the commercial line uh, in 2020. I know uh, quite a bit of that is the uh, MVP program coming online, but I would, I would guess that nearly, nearly half also coming from uh, some, some ASO clients on the Blue Cross book that officially joined the program in 2020. Uh, so we now have the, the majority of our ASO book uh, fully participating in this program, and that's great. On the challenges side, um, you know, we I think we have two two or three big challenges. Uh, COVID-19 obviously um, has disrupted our ability to meaningfully measure quality or financial. Um, our, our results are are sort of as, as far off um, from what we would have predicted, as as you saw from from both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, our new quality work plan approach, I, I think, is a very exciting experiment. I'm feeling very good about it. Um, it's still a little early for us to report out on that. That's a 2021 effort. And, and I would just say across the, the entire program, you know, the one thing we're still looking for, both on the quality side and the financial side, is that strong connection between OneCare's work and the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, you know, we've, we've yet to be able to demonstrate a really strong correlation between the financial performance, the, the uh, quality performance, and one cares work. Um, so we'll continue to work on that. I, I think that's, that's really the most important thing we can do in this program. So we can go to the next slide, Michelle. Next content slide, financial outcomes. And uh, just let me know if it's up. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, the, those on the Green Mountain Care Board will appreciate the, the second bullet here was, was penned by our uh, chief actuary. I think you'll, you'll recognize his voice there. Um, truly, I think what's important to take away from this slide is that uh, we, we altered our risk program with OneCare dramatically uh, for 2020 and also 2021 because of the pandemic. Uh, we, as I said earlier, we didn't want the providers or the market to be bearing um, you know, the, the challenge of this risk model um, through COVID-19. So we, we dramatically reduced those, those corridors. Um, and, and really, we also saw this tremendous distortion of normal 
utilization patterns um, that started very early in, in the pandemic. And the, the data we have from 2021 really tells us nothing about the One Care program. It's, it's just so skewed um, by COVID-19. And we're sure that 2021 uh, will, will be similar. And at this point, we're preparing uh, for a 2022 uh, that is still likely to be pretty significantly disrupted. And I, I think our contract will, will reflect that. You can go ahead. Michelle, uh, two slides to the uh, impact of on quality in 29 or 2020. So very similar story here, um, and you, you've heard this from the other presenters. Uh, our our old scorecard uh, was based on those benchmarks from from CMS and NCQA. We don't have those benchmarks for 2020, um, uh, and we we saw uh, like what what Amy presented just a few slides ago. Um, 2020 results that are just really hard to interpret. Uh, the numbers are all over the place and they don't appear to be uh, related at all uh, to what um, OneCare has been working on. We, we understand uh, that, that COVID has uh, diverted everybody's attention and um, disrupted the, just the normal pattern of care uh, so that those measures are, are very hard. Uh, for us to, to report on, and, and we really don't deduce anything um, from, from what occurred in 2020. Um, I also just sort of note on this slide that this could be problematic for us uh, for the next couple of years. 2020 was to be our baseline for our large group population. Uh, they're new to the program in 2020, uh, so we don't have any, any history there with One Care. Um, obviously, this, this first year is going to be pretty distorted. And it may take us a year or two to really understand what the, the baseline uh, for that pool looks like. And then, and then finally, for, for us, as, as you heard from, from Medicaid, um, 2020 was a reporting year only uh, for us on the quality side. In addition to changing the risk model, we changed uh, the scorecard model as well so that the providers would not be penalized for what we knew was going to be uh, extreme disruption. I think we can go to the next slide. And then I, I did promise to talk a little bit about the quality improvement work plan. So I'll, I'll land uh, this presentation there and then and uh, can certainly take questions if you have any. Um, but we, you know, as I mentioned, and I, you may remember, I, I reported this, on this in the past, um, we see in the scorecard in 2018 and 2019, some bright spots, some down spots, um, but what we haven't been able to show uh, in the past is consistency across uh, measures across years. So a measure that might seem like it's on a, a trend to improve uh, in 2018 um, doesn't stay on that trend in 2019. And the other thing that we haven't been able to show in the past is where, where OneCare's efforts were directly uh, related to the outcomes that we were seeing on the quality program. It, it honestly seemed a little bit random. And when we compared the results of that scorecard to what was happening with the rest of our population, there just wasn't a clear trend um, or, or any clear indication that we could see one care's performance in that scorecard. So we decided to, to change that, to do an experiment and really try to get focused on this. So instead of having the broad-based scorecard with, we had what, 10, 12 measures, uh, in the in the original 2020 scorecard, we're now moving to a work plan method um, that's focused currently on just two measures. So what we asked OneCare to do was to really laser in on on a couple of measures that they were intending to work intensely to improve. And for for 2021, uh, those are the measures shown in the middle of the slide here: controlling blood blood pressure and having that um, screening for depression and um, and, uh, and substance use with the pediatric and teen population. So those were areas they planned to work on. So we just stepped away from the scorecard and said instead, okay, what does that work look like? What will you do throughout 2021 to make pro progress on these measures? Let's put that into an enumerated work plan. And instead of scoring just on the outcome score, we'll actually score on your work throughout the year to move these measures and then um, we'll have a lot more confidence when we get the results of, of the, the scoring on these measures 
in what we're actually seeing there. Let, let's try to demonstrate that your work on these measures can really move the needle. Uh, so that's what we're focused on there. I, I'm pretty excited uh, that, that this is gonna tell us a lot about how to structure a quality program that really ties uh, the effort to the outcomes. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a, a big deal for us, and we're looking to expand this in 2022. We're already talking to OneCare about the, the potential to add a third metric to the work plan. Um, we would probably be targeting their um, mental health and substance use disorder support. That's a place where I think as a system, we're tending to lag behind. Our, our scores have not historically been very strong there, uh, and we know it's, it's important to the entire system, so it seems like a, a nice place for us to focus going forward. So that's all I have to present. I can take questions now or, or later as the, the board prefers. Thank you. I think we'll hold the questions till the end if that's okay, Andrew. Okay, Andrew. Absolutely, I'll be here. Okay. And Carla, I see that you just popped up, so I will turn it over to you. You're on mute, Carla. You're on mute, Carla. Thank you. <laughs> I am Carla Renders from MVP. I'm the leader of professional re relations and value-based programs for Eastern New York and Vermont. Um, I also have some of my colleagues accompanying me here on the phone today, so I'll let them introduce themselves as well. Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Monroe. Um, I'm vice president of network strategy and strategic partnerships. Um, including New York and Vermont. Matt? Hi, everyone. Matt Lombardo, senior leader in the actuarial department. Hope everyone's doing well. And Katie. Hi, everyone. Katie Poole. I oversee our quality measurement and improvement teams here at MVP. Great. Thank you. So we can um, get started on the first slide. Since this is our, our first time presenting to this group, um, being it's our, our first year in the arrangement with One Care, we did want to start the presentation um, and outline MVP's mission, which is to continue to improve our members' health and well being through innovation and collaboration, um, which we cultivate both internally and in our arrangements with our partners, such as One Care. Um, our focus is always our members and everything we do, and with them at the forefront, we believe and we intend to create the healthiest communities. We can advance to the next slide. So how do we get there? How do we achieve our mission and our vision um, through our core values? We want to be the difference for our customers, meaning our members, and make them feel reassured that their health care needs will be met. We are curious as to their wants and needs and work to anticipate those wants and needs and address them proactively for a better consumer experience. And finally, we are humble. Humility allows us to be keep an open mind and be receptive to innovation and innovative ideas from all our constituents, be, them, be they employees, members, providers, or our business partners. We can go to the next slide. So moving on to details of our arrangement with OneCare and the associated financial performance for 2020. So um, the, the overview of the program, again, this was our inaugural year of our arrangement with OneCare. So our presentation is going to be a bit shorter um, than the other since we don't have year over year to share. Um, it was a one-year contract and included um, commercial lives under qualified health plans, meaning commercial, individual, and small group membership. It's an upside only total cost of care shared savings arrangement with the amount of savings being subject to a minimum and maximum savings rate and also additionally a quality gate. And we'll, we'll look at um, the quality component in the next section of the presentation. The quality metrics used for the quality gate were metrics selected from the all payer model and aligned with membership in the commercial lines of business. As part of the arrangement, MVP provides one care with a data extract consisting of eligibility claims and financials for the attributed population on a monthly basis. 
and additionally financial reporting on a monthly basis as well. Um, we also um, provide one care with a primary care investment payment, which is distributed to the downstream providers. And uh, we also had a care management payment available to one care for members that one care identified as high risk. We can advance to the next slide. So just to review some of our successes and opportunities, our successes were due to a highly collaborative team at One Care and MVP that worked together to get this program up and running the first year, and we did meet all contractual timelines. Um, the program did result in savings for year one. Again, it should be noted this that this was an unprecedented year due to COVID. I don't think I need to say it again. All of the other presenters have alluded to that as well, um, which caused utilization to plummet starting at the beginning of March, um, which had a favorable impl implication on the budget. Um, there are also some opportunities for improvement that we're working on in our next iteration of the contract, such as enhanced alignment of reporting and analytics, ability to better identify and engage members needing care management, and the selection of quality metrics that better reflect the MVP population. And you'll see what I mean by that. When we get to the quality scorecard, we did have very low denominators in some of the metrics, um, rendering them invalid. So moving on to the next slide, actual financial results. So what we're looking at here is an illustration demonstrating how OneCare performed against the budget. So the budget was established by um, you looking at previous year, meaning 2019 utilization, and coming up with a per member per month um, dollar amount, which was $420.36 per member. As you can see in quarter one, the actual spend was a bit over budget. And then with the entrance of COVID in March, you do see a large drop in utilization. Um, it should be noted too, though, that each quarter does show year to date spend. So quarter two really means the period from January to June, not March to June. Um, I'm sorry, April to June. <laughs> Uh, attribution for the program was a little over 9,000 members, and OneCare did achieve, achieve savings coming under budget at a rate of $384.02 per member per month for a savings of $36.34 um, per member per month by the end of 2020. Um, ultimately, um, taking into the minimum, taking into account the minimum and maximum savings rate and the quality gate. This did result in a distribution of savings of $1,062,000 to OneCare. And that was just communicated to OneCare about a week and a half ago. So this isn't finalized yet with them, but um, you know, our contractual agreement was to get the final results mid-November. So we can advance to the next slide, actually the next one to go into the quality program overview. Um, so again, quality metrics were selected by OneCare using um, a selection from the all-payer model. Um, 2019 CMS benchmarks were used. The point syst a point system determines the amount of shared savings due to OneCare, and the subsequent, sl subsequent slide will show the scorecare scorecard that demonstrates how the points were distributed across measures. The final score, score on the scorecard is what ultimately determines the amount of savings to one care. It should be noted that three out of four of the measures had such low denominators, some of them only had one or to four members, um, that the points for those members were redistributed to the rest of the metrics. Um, the scorecard that you will see in the next slide was distributed to one care. A preliminary scorecard was distributed to one care at the beginning of the second quarter of 21, and then it's finalized at the end of the year along with the financial settlement. Because of the nine months of claims run out required to settle the program, the 2020 results contractually, like I just stated, were due to one care on 11-15. We can advance to the next slide. So this is the, the scorecard with the results for 2020. This is um, the format that we distribute this to OneCare. 
with each of the metrics selected for the program. Again, the three highlighted metrics are the ones where there was such a low denominator that the points had to be just redistributed. Um, so the 30 day follow up after discharge from the ED, the follow up from ED for mental health and the follow up after hospitalization. I mean, you can see there the, de the denominators are either one or four members. And then the key at the bottom of the scorecard shows what percentage of the points are earned based on the percentile that one care reached for each measure according to the CMS benchmarks. Because the 90th percentile was reached for all cause readmissions and the diabetes measure, 100% of those points were earned, while half of the points were earned for adolescent well care and zero points earned for controlling high blood pressure and initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drug as they those two came in below the 50th percentile resulting in a total point distribution of 50 points. Keep in mind again that the low scores and the low denominators could obviously be impacted by the pandemic. That concludes our presentation on the MVP side if there's any, well, you, we're waiting to the end for questions, so I look forward to questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to One Care. So I looks like it looks I saw like I saw Derek. Derek, there you are. Uh, so, uh, if you've prepared any comments, please please feel free. Hi, everybody. My name is Josiah Mueller. I am Director of Value-Based Care here at One Care Vermont. It's a, truly an honor to be here representing One Care. Background, I'm a registered nurse with a clinical background, and I'm just really excited about working in value-based care here in Vermont. Good afternoon, everybody. Derek Raines, I'm the Director of Payment Reform for One Care Vermont. Uh, I have a legal background uh, by training. Uh, happy to be here working on this important work. Thanks for having me. I'm uncertain if we have any other one care. Can't see the full list. I'll just pause for a moment. Okay, so um, I'll get started with just a couple of comments. So, first and foremost, we just want to reiterate what we've heard today, which is, you know, these are just extremely challenging times for our providers, um, and we are, you know, we see our role as doing everything we can to support our providers during these challenging times. One of the ways in which we're doing that related to this presentation today is, you know, so we, we have these multiple payer programs. We identify our quality results well after the year's over. Here it is November, you know, we're talking about 2020. And so our providers came to us and said, we'd really like to get more timely data to know how we're doing at a practice level, at an organizational level, as opposed to sort of, you know, months after their performance year um, without that granularity that really allows them to improve their operations to, you know, Dial, dial the right dials and improve their quality. So this year in 2021, what we've done is we've created a system where we, on a quarterly basis, quarterly basis so drill down quarterly. to the practice level, um, organizational level, excuse me, uh, and providing a sample of patients and that practice's performance for that sample. So, and, you know, a little bit of data, much more timely, and our quality improvement specialist team is meeting with practices so that they can work through these results together and provide support as necessary. Second, I think it's an important point to note is just, you know, obviously these are very difficult to interpret these results. Personally, you know, here at OneCare, we're, we're interested to see what, what these look like nationwide and, you know, can we really draw much conclusion from these? I'm not convinced just yet. Um, I, I'm interested to see where are the ebbs and flows given the nature of COVID and how it did fluctuate in different populations throughout the past, you know, throughout the year. And, Year plus. And then finally, so here at OneCare, when we work through these processes, it's it's really about delivering these results to our internal groups and internal structures, internal committees to talk about action plans and next steps and what can we do to improve. And so that's, you know, in the coming months, we will be working through these results with uh, our committees and our governance structure to evaluate next steps and the best plan. You know, just a couple couple comments briefly that I would add to that. Um, from the payment uh, lens, most things have already largely been covered by uh, the, the provider, the payer uh, presentations. 
Um, but I would add that from a payment angle, uh, like Josiah said, we've really just been trying to support our provider network. Um, so that largely came in the form of limiting downside risk uh, with corridors um, and then also uh, just making sure the fixed payments uh, continue to operate as normal um, so that they could count on that revenue when uh, utilization and other things were were a little all over the map. So uh, that's all that's all I wanted to comment on today. I, I look forward to being here to, to assist with any questions that anyone might have. Thank you both. Uh, with that, Chair Mullen, I'll turn it back to you for any board questions or public comments. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm going to go in alphabetical order and call on the different board members to ask questions. So, I'm so going to start with board member Holmes, Jessica. Great. Um, thank you. That was a lot of helpful information um, from everybody, the payers and, and one care. Really appreciate it. I guess one of the things I'm taking away from this, the clear trend here is that, particularly with the quality data, but also obviously with the financial data, um, the pandemic has had a huge impact. And when I think about how we're going to, you know, um, find comparable, you know, make meaningful comparisons over time, I'm even thinking going forward, it's going to be challenging to do so compared to 2020 or even 2021, if there's on the quality side, if there's changes in methodology that are happening, uh, certainly on the denominator side with the you know huge disruptions in utilization that we're seeing, we're probably still continuing to see. And I guess I'm just wondering if anybody can speak to um, how we're gonna ever <laughs> make meaningful comparisons over time, even in 2022 and 2023, looking back, I guess I'm just thinking about that. That's one of my big takeaways. Obviously, it's a big takeaway for everybody. What does the post-COVID world look like? But I'm thinking specifically about this evaluation um, of you know the performance here based on these payer contracts with these big disruptions. So I don't know if anybody can speak to that, and maybe there's just no answer, but I would ask that any of the uh, commercial or Medicaid on the line, if you all have a response, um, please feel free to, to chime in. No need to hand raise or anything or one care. Um, and then Jess, the only point that I could add to that is that um, we anticipate NORC doing another round of evaluations, and I'm really curious to see how they handle this as well. Um, we might you know, learn something from them in that aspect, um, and how they how they choose to kind of address this this big shift. That was the first kind of place my mind went was you know the fact that we are grateful that the NORC did their evaluation. You know, a gold standard evaluation was able to be completed prior to the pandemic, and they found you know both our ACO compared to a comparative ACO and our state compared to a sample of patients to adequately represent a comparison group of folks, they showed savings and they showed fewer hospital stays and shorter hospital stays and lower readmissions rates. So it's a great question and I, you know, I'm with you, Michelle. I'd, lo I'd love to see how, how they handle that. All right, it doesn't sound like I have any takers on that, <laughs> but I guess it's something we're going to have to work on going forward. Um, Andrew, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to, you mentioned important learnings from the uh, hospital fixed perspective payment uh, pilot that you're doing, and I know it's a small sample, um, but I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to what those learnings are and some of the challenges that you see in scaling that program up to more hospitals. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? We can. If anybody who's not speaking could mute themselves, it would be greatly appreciated. Off my audio here. Are you able to hear me at all? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. I guess the bigger question is, can you hear us, Andrew? He 
might even be frozen. Are you there, Andrew? Welcome to the. Sounds like maybe he's dialing in and it looked like maybe Derek had something to add to the last talking point. Jess, I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, Derek, but... Derek. No, that's fine. I, thank you for that. I was just going to briefly add that I think it's an iterative process that we're going to have to continue to work with the payers as well um, in going forward and collaborate with them to try to learn whatever we can as time goes on. It was a small comment. I didn't mean to interrupt the process. <laughs> Maybe I'll just ask another quick follow-up question to that. I'm just wondering, has anybody done an assessment of whether some of the quality measures, which are process measures, whether there's an equivalence in a telemedicine visit and an in-person visit on some of those process measures? I imagine it's more difficult, for example, to test blood pressure, obviously, on a telemedicine visit than an in-person visit. So that metric would be problematic if we're seeing a shift towards towards uh, telemedicine during the pandemic. So I'm just wondering if there's been any attempt to think through that on those quality metrics. I know I'll just say from the GMCB staff perspective, not necessarily um, process measure payer ACO wise, but um, from our perspective, we are hoping to do an analysis on any uptake in telehealth utilization throughout 2020 and into 2021. So while not entirely getting at sort of that process that you're speaking about, it's something that we wanted to make sure we had a clearer understanding of. So you'll see that when staff present our 2020 annual total cost of care results, I believe, so early next year. Andrew, are you back with us? I hope so. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we can. Do you want to attempt to answer uh, Board Member Holmes' question? Yeah, sure. So the, um, the learning I referred to was largely technical. Um, you know, coercing a system that was designed to pay fee-for-service claims into a fixed perspective payment model. And um, we, truthfully, we, we had some stumbles um, with, with Southwestern. Some of the mistakes that we made, I think were similar uh, to mistakes we've, we've heard about from other payers, but I think we've, we've ironed a huge amount of those out. And we've also learned a lot about how to automate um, this processing uh, so that um, we don't have quite as much spreadsheet going on, uh, spreadsheeting going on as we had for the first few months of the program uh, that we're currently enrolled in. So just a quick follow-up question. Is there anything you can speak to about um, sort of the hospital appetite for moving to a fixed prospective payment conversations you might have had with other hospitals and what their interest is in it and what, you know, what learnings that Southwestern has had that, I mean, you can't speak for Southwestern here, but um, pitching it to other hospitals, is there any obvious obstacles or besides the technical? Yeah, I, I think there are only two obstacles. One, the big one is COVID, right? We, we just need to get this behind us. Um, we had very high hospital interest in this program across the state, um, you know, uh, six months before COVID hit, <laughs> while we were finalizing the, the project to bring the technology up to speed. And, and there were a few other hiccups along the way. Um, you know, the cybersecurity challenge, I think that UVMHN had slowed them down very understandably. Uh, but I, I think interest was pre pretty high. Uh, so I'm not, I, I'm expecting that once we get out of COVID, kind of look towards, you know, mid to late 2022, um, we should be really well positioned to get back to where we were. Uh, the only other remaining obstacle I can see is that we do have to come up with a, a new way of target setting. Um, if we're going to be successful in fixed perspective payment, we've used uh, essentially a retrospective risk adjustment in the past um, that looks at what actually happened and then helps us score the risk of that population. Um, that's fine for a retrospective settlement approach, you know, where we're settling six months after the period is over. Um, but obviously, to get to fixed perspective payment, uh, we're going to have to do something different there. We're going to have to bring that risk adjustment up to the target setting um, at the beginning of the cycle so that we can make the appropriate payments. And that's a pretty big methodology change. It's gonna take a lot of 
um, you know, financial crunching by all, all involved, everybody's going to have to feel good about about a new approach. And I, I do think that'll take some time and effort. Great. Well, thank you. That's really promising to hear. Um, that's all I have, Kevin. I'll pass it along. Thanks, Jess. Next, we're going to turn to board member Lunt. Robin. Great. Thank you. Um, I did have uh, actually a follow up on this topic for Andrew. So um, my understanding of the your current payment methodology is that it is reconciled to fee for service. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's right. And so when you when you're when you mentioned moving the risk adjustment up um, to the front end, are you thinking about that as part of what needs to happen to move that from a reconciled fee for service to a true fixed perspective payment? Or is that something that you're thinking needs to happen either way? Yeah, no, that that's right. In in order to get to unreconciled, we we've, we've got to make that change. Absolutely. Great. And then my other question about it was, have you thought, and I, because of COVID, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have been able to do this work with the hospitals, but I'm wondering if you've had any thinking about um, sort of the critical access hospital um, incentives in a fixed perspective payment versus maybe other hospital types. Um, You know, um, we haven't. It's a great question, and it, it's something that I would expect we would work on together with OneCare. Um, sure. You know, I, I part of their mission is thinking about how to get the right financial assessment or incentive to the right places in their network to support the work they're trying to accomplish. Um, so that, that you know, that's something we'd probably have to figure out together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I also had a question for the folks from MVP. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great uh, to have your report from um, your first year in the model. Um, I was curious, uh, since your program was a shared savings program, if you've thought about moving that into at least a shared savings and uh, risk program or and or uh, really what you're planning or thinking is around uh, moving towards fixed perspective payments. So this is Scott Momro, um, board member lunch. Uh, absolutely. When we were in discussions back in 2019 with One Care Vermont, it was a glide path contemplation towards risk as everyone has discussed the impact of COVID has certainly um, impacted that, that that glide path for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we're, we're still, as everyone is, trying to understand the impact on quality measures, member engagement related to population health and quality, as well as the actuarial models. I, I, th I think Andrew Garland did an excellent job articulating the impact on the models, and we're certainly working with our actuaries on how do you look at those targets moving forward as you move towards risk. Uh, we've also heard from OneCare Vermont as well as individual uh, participants. Obviously, this is a challenging time to move towards downside risk as we still have a, a COVID hangover you know, happening as it relates to um, just volatile utilization and we're still trying to understand the patterns, but that is um, the direction we're heading and we're, we're also supportive of the move towards um, global capitation and the models that are consistent with the all-payer model. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, COVID, I, I don't think we can say it too many times. COVID has really made it challenging in 2020, 2021, and knock on wood, uh, I hope we come out of it in 2022 so that um, we're able to really refocus on our health reform goals as a state. Um, the only other, this isn't really a, a question per se, I'll just um, throw it out there, is that knowing that many of the the results from 2020, the financial results are just coming out now um, in the past week or or so. Um, I think 
one of the areas that we're going to need to look at when we come back to the one care budget is how that how the shared savings sort of fits into uh, the budget as it was filed. So I'll just make that as a note um, as an area of interest at when we move back to the, the budget process. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board member Pelham. Tom. Well, uh, thank you. As I as I listen to this conversation, um, it's obviously clear uh, in an understatement that COVID has been uh, um, a shot in everybody's side, a negative shot. But one positive thing I'm sensing is that this conversation is moving along and looking forward. Um, that here we have all the players around the table. A lot of the terminology um, is well understood across uh, the, the folks that are involved here. Um, some important infrastructure has been built in terms of relationships uh, with one care. And so I'm my sense is that process wise, you know, we have lost some time, but uh, the, the networking and uh, interaction of the players uh, is, is ha has moved forward despite COVID. Um, my first question is having to do with kind of the, the um, scale growth build out, especially for uh, Medicaid and Medicare. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, those have, uh, and I think it was slide seven, shows some tremendous growth, growth rates uh, there. And um, I'm just wondering, what, what, would, uh, what are the expectations for a full build out in terms of uh, scale growth for Medicaid and Medicare? Um, because, you know, relative to commercial, commercial is still quite immature. But we must be getting to a fairly mature build out in terms of the uh, scale growth for Medicaid and Medicare. And I'm wondering if we have a sense of what that additional margin might be. Uh, sure. So I'll start with just one um, statistic from our 2020 scale report, which is we did uh, a couple of additional analyses. You might recall that we presented to the board, and one of the really notable ones was that we were at about 90% uh, penetration of provider uh, participation in the state. Um, so, you know, that there's not a whole lot of extra margin there, despite not meeting, not meeting scale targets. Um, specific to Medicare and Medicaid, I can ask Sarah Lindbergh if there's anything she wants to point out about Medicare and perhaps out of state care, and then I'll turn it to Alicia and Amy. Yeah, I guess the way I think about it is you pick up people by more providers participating, um, by having more payers participating, which we're doing a very good job on. And then um, from there, kind of monkeying with the attribution algorithm if we're wedded to a prospective model. So um, I think that we're in the land of diminishing returns. There's certainly some geographic attribution models that Medicaid is bravely piloting that um, other programs may uh, consider. Um, and there are also, I think, opportunities if uh, other methodologies that also might help, but um, I think with these current models, we're kind of nearing saturation. So, uh, so uh, just to follow on with that a little bit, if we are nearing saturation in terms of Medicare Medicaid attribution, um, uh, you know, uh, and certainly we're nowhere near that having to do with the commercial folks. I'm just wondering if if Medicare, if, if the, you know, the build out, for example, of fixed prospective payments for Medicaid, which is uh, pretty much in play, and we are trying to get to get to that uh, with Medicare and kind of current negotiations, you know, will that become a, a, a kind of a comforting a source of information for the commercial folks to, uh, you know, pick up the pace uh, in, in their arena? So that um, we can all be moving forward at um, um, at a uh, collegial collegial rate, I would say. Because I, I I do I do go back to the hospital budget process where um, I think it was the um, I have it here somewhere where the overall in terms of like true fixed perspective payments the overall rate for 2021 projected budget was 17%. Medicare was at 41.8%. 
Medicaid at 42% and commercial at less than 1%. So uh, um, I'm I'm just uh, kind of wondering is is that as we get to maturity with Medicare and Medicaid does that become a, a beacon uh, hopefully you know for the commercial folks to uh, feel that their risk might not be as bad as as uh, as as they might fear now that's 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 an observation um, my next question had to do with. Um, and I, I think I can answer this myself because of the retrospective nature of the benchmarks for 2020. But my question was, as Vermont pushes forward with Medicare toward unreconciled FPPs, do the settlement results for 2020 offer any insight on that discussion? Um, and my guess is not so much just because, you know, it was it was a the, the benchmark used was a, a retrospective one as opposed to a uh, a current one would that be right sarah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that 2020 has a lot of precedent for us in a lot of ways <laughs> okay so um <clears throat> this one is for the medicaid folks uh in negotiations between diva and one care how is the cost shift factored in and so a specific example in my mind was that for 2021, DIVA went to the legislature uh, for the 2021 budget adjustment and made the statement. I don't know if it ended up being the, the final result, but that uh, that they were not going to allow any reimbursement in increases for 2021 other than those uh, that were related to FQHCs. And so I'm just I'm I'm asked so would like to hear from the Medicaid folks. How do you handle the cost shift in your negotiations? So as part of our rate development methodology, we take into consideration any projected changes for the coming performance period in Medicaid reimbursements. Uh, as, as you mentioned, in 2021, we did not have any funds available in DIVA's appropriation to support rate changes, with the exception of those rate changes that are federally mandated, including the updates that were implemented for federally qualified health centers. Um, to the extent we do have funds available for subsequent performance years, that anticipated change in rate will be factored into the rate development process as part of our pricing and assumptions. Beyond that, there isn't specific contemplation of a cost shift in the development of rates or the contract negotiations. So um, one takeaway for me from that is that let's let's assuming that all of this investment in healthcare reform is positive and it's yielding results. Um, and I just I, I've said this before, but I just worry that the cost shift and as it occurred unfolded again in 2021 i'm worried that the cost shift becomes a siphon out of the system uh in terms of um uh the, the, the that network kind of getting the benefit of any efficiencies uh you know, that they might be finding in the system attributable to it so um that is just a worry i have um my my next and final question was um how, uh, given, uh, how, how is the appropriation process work? For example, with the, with this set, with the, uh, where was the quote here? The quote was um, the $15 million settlement. Uh, right, DIVA will issue one care a re reconciliation payment at a, of approximately 15.4 million. So that is, so we'll, that will be being, be paid out by the state in the current fiscal year, I assume, but it's for something that occurred retrospectively. So I'm just wondering how that gets manages, how DIVA manages that in the state budget process. Insofar as DIVA and OneCare agree upon a price at the beginning of the performance year, there is the expectation that the agreed upon price is going to work within DIVA's overall appropriation. 
um, to the extent there is any difference between what DIVA has appropriated and its financial liability to one care at the close of a performance year, that would be addressed through the budget adjustment process. We believe that there may be some inclusion in the budget adjustment of uh, contemplation for the reconciliation payment um, because of differences that were driven by the COVID-19 public health emergency and DIVA's response to that in other programmatic areas, including the additional caseload that Medicaid has been carrying for the last more than one year. Right. That's all the, uh, the, the the timing issues here have got to be a little bit difficult to, to manage, but uh, thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you, Tom. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for, well, I see Andrew, you have your hand raised. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman Mullen. I just wanted to um, just to briefly uh, offer some input on the question about um, commercials participating in the in the scale targets. Um, uh, just based on that that observation, uh, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is considerably north of one percent participating. We're we're actually above twenty percent, and uh, and actually I think the limiting factors now are are generally beyond our control. So you're aware we have uh, individual, small group large group insured and ASO all participating. So that's really all commercial segments. Uh, we do have one large uh, ASO client who has opted not to participate. Um, and that, you know, will continue until, until they've seen, I think, uh, some strong results from the program. Um, but other than that, for us, it's really provider participation that is uh, limiting uh, future attribution. So unlike uh, Medicaid, we're not at 96% participation. Uh, there's many providers who are participating with Medicaid or Medicare who have chosen not yet to participate on the commercial side. And I think that's about uh, stepping into that risk-taking arena uh, incrementally. So uh, OneCare keeps a really great uh, list on their website. You can go out and take a look and see which practices are participating with which program. I refer to it all the time uh, as I'm talking with providers about this program, but, but I think that's the big limiting factor uh, for us, at least, that if we had um, the rest of the network participating, our numbers would jump up considerably. And then just the other observation I make is that there is a, at least one large national uh, payer and a couple of you know, smaller uh, nationals in, in the state who don't participate at all on the commercial side. And if they're, you know, they're carrying a significant amount of membership here and there. Um, so um, just as we're accounting for everything that could be in that bucket, I, I wanted to note those things as well. Thanks, Andrew. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment, and I'm going to remind anybody with public comment to address any of your comments to me as chair. And so at this point, you can either raise your hand or if you are just on the phone and not uh, through Teams, you can just speak up. Is there any public comment at this time? Uh, Julie Wasserman. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first uh, is related to DIVA and its capitated payments um, to the hospitals for 2020. Um, we all know that the hospitals got paid even though uh, they did not provide the usual level of care. In fact, as one speaker said, utilization had plummeted in 2020. Uh, capitated payments are touted uh, as a great approach to incentivize providers to keep people healthy. Um, but that's not exactly what happened in 2020 because the providers were not seeing patients, so they didn't have the opportunity to keep them healthy. In fact, we know that the providers weren't, were, were probably not keeping people healthy as evidenced by the pent up demand that we're seeing right now and also the late stage illnesses that we're also seeing. So uh, there's the capitated piece. The, additionally, there's the um, quality performance. Um, unfortunately, uh, the PowerPoint uh, showed no slide on the Medicaid quality results. But um, if you look pretty closely, 
uh, you can see that the ACO performed uh, poorly in their Medicaid quality measures. Uh, One Care's performance worsened in nine of the 10 measures compared to last year. So basically the declines uh, in performance were across the board, nine out of 10 measures. So my, my question uh, with regard to these issues is how, how do we explain DIVA paying OneCare $15.4 million for less care and poor performance? an interesting question. I don't know if um, anybody from DIVA has any comment, but uh, certainly uh, we're working through a lot of those same questions, Julie, as we go through the uh, budget process. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have an, another question. Well, let's, let's give, uh, let's give uh, oh, okay. Alicia or um, Amy a chance to respond if they so desire. Oh, sure. Alicia, do you wish to? Sure, I think the, the one thing that we would reiterate is that we saw significant value in the prospective payment structure within our VMNG program in ensuring additional stability to the healthcare system during the period of system shutdown and then as the system was returning to more normal rates of utilization. Um, whereas uh, providers who were relying primarily on fee-for-service revenue had much more difficulty withstanding the, the effects of reduced utilization on their cash flow. I think the prospective payments were important to ensure that our providers were able to stay open and continue to be responsive to the needs of Vermonters during this time even when those needs weren't strictly consistent with what we had seen historically. And on the quality point, I think, I think it speaks to the question that board member Holmes was posing to the full group. Um, we know that 2020 was radically different from other years. It will be difficult to compare performance in 2020 to either years prior or years that follow given how different it was in terms of what our system observed. And that's something that we will have to work on I think, as a, a collective. Um, and we'll have to see how nationally that is approached as well. OK, next I'm going to call on Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. This is sort of a half question and half comment. Um, one of the difficulties I've seen in, in the whole presentation today that it inc it's getting increasingly difficult to hook anything one anything to something else. Um, the, uh, I, the basic idea of shifting from uh, fee for service to capitation, the whole the sort of the 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 centerpiece of the whole reform movement is to change. The, uh, the incentive to work on doctors in the that are actually de delivering care in the system. And more and more, it seems to me, it's very difficult. I, 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 there, I think there is something like 1,800 to 2,000 doctors in the state. I, I can't believe that there's a single doctor that actually does any doctoring work, which is hard and takes time, and has, a, has the faintest idea what is going on with all this blizzard of back and, black, back and forth. So that, that's basically a comment. I'm just one, but I do have a specific question for Andrew Garland. One of the things that I think is that uh, people keep talking about One Care Vermont. One Care Vermont is just basically the hospitals. And um, if, and, and, uh, and one, of the, one of the things that happens at least, and it has, I think, not just now, but has the last 50 years, the money that the, the federal government and, and the state governments pay for Medicare and Medicare, the the, uh, the number they choose. But the the the, uh, the people that are paying the people that are paying hospitals and doctors uh, essentially um, the are essentially um, the private sector, and that's Blue Cross and MVP. And so the people that know the most about you know what where this money is going is Blue Cross and MVP. Um, I remember going back in the back in the uh, back 20 years ago that that, uh, you know, a Blue Cross representative would go to Northwest and sit down with 
uh, you know, the CEO of the hospital and just this, they'd just argue about it. And Blue Cross would tell them what they what they would were willing to pay. And and so the people that really know where all the money is going is Blue Cross, is Blue Cross. They're the ones and, and MVP to the extent that they share in the market. So my question would be, my question would be to, and since I should get to a question here, Kevin, if you could ask Andrew Garland, if 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 he if Blue Cross has has uh, feels um, unhappy about some hospital way it behaves, even in the quality area, actually, you know, one care Vermont can't put on a band aid. If this problem with quality, it's a qual it's quality delivered by Vermont's hospitals and its doctors. It, why can't Blue Cross get at that directly? They're the ones that have, they're the ones that uh, they uh, really the, have the balance of power. They're the ones that have the leverage uh, with the hospitals, not One Care. Well, it's a little bit outside of the scope of what we've asked uh, Andrew to come and talk to us about today. But Andrew, if you wish to uh, to answer, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I, I guess uh, I, I could give a really long answer. Uh, the short one is um, that we're both working with One Care Vermont, and we continue to maintain strong um, collaborative relationships with the, the hospitals and providers across the system. So uh, we, we talk quality with One Care, right? We, we, we ask them, hey, if you're, if you're really organizing physician-led change, help us with these things. Let, let's figure out how we change the system, change the payment to, to allow our providers to be more successful in these areas. But at the same time, we continue to work directly with providers. Um, we have contracts with all of these providers that we negotiate directly. And our quality improvement department um, ha has many, many programs that continue to operate independently of the One Care program. And, and they probably will for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, just think of it. Think of it as, as you know, continuing to exist in, in two places, and it, and I think that'll that'll happen for a long time. Okay, next I'm going to call on Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Julie Wasserman kind of stole what I was going to say, which was a good thing because she phrased it so nicely. Uh, with the capitation payments, I keep thinking of the wait times at UVM that have come out over in recent articles, but I won't dwell so much on that now because she already mentioned it. Uh, Ham made some good points too that I was thinking about, but one thing is just more of a comment. And throughout this presentation, I've constantly listened to a word called the payers. And to reiterate what is obviously the obvious that we all know is that we are the payers. We, the people, we pay, we pay the system. The insurance companies are the middle, the insurance companies, Diva, et cetera, are the middle people from which it flows through. I just want to reiterate that because we are the ones who are going to be paying these bills. Thank you, Walter. Next, I'm going to call on Robert Hoffman. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, I want to make a correction to Ham. He consistently describes this as just essentially a fiscal pass through. It's not. All the contracts state that there are to be institutional level rigorous programs around quality measures, specific disease states. Um, and as Blue Cross Blue Shield enumerated, there's really no evidence yet to date, four or five years into this project, to even in a corollary way, demonstrate that improvement projects are having an impact on savings and quality. Uh, moreover, I would challenge the ACO to present the programs that they've done around disease states like diabetes. How frequently are they pulling quality measures or are they just sampling for the quality score once annually? That would be nice to see. While the rest of the country's ACOs are using AMA programs like Together to Goal for Diabetes, we really have no evidence. Blue Cross can't certainly point to it. How or what is being done to impact these measures? 
Um, as far as Julie's comment, I'll piggyback on that. Uh, to make it more precise, what's happened for 2020 is uh, Medicare and Medicaid have decided to socialize the losses and privatize the gains. They're happy to explain away any possibility of discerning what happened in the world of quality or holding the ACO accountable for it when it comes to quality measures. And the ACO is clearly paid in part based on quality measures. They're happy to dispense with that. And then concurrently to pay out $23.3 million combined uh, when utilization, as they acknowledge, plummeted. When uh, insurers last year were giving money back to premium payers, I think we should all be asking why, why is the ACO not doing the same? And if they're not going to do that, where are they going to direct these savings other than back into the 62% holder of Vermont Healthcare spending the UVM Health Network. So I would exhort the board as it continues deliberating over the budget process to figure out how Vermonters are going to equitably participate in a uh, historic exogenous event in 2020 that uh, frankly, as Mr. Carpenter said, as the payers they should be participating. They're essentially given back rather than just passing it on to the US. Blue Cross said, and I said earlier, can really demonstrate nothing to show how savings are being generated. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next, I'm going to go back to Julie Wasserman, who has her hand raised again. Thank you. Uh, this is my last comment, and it's uh, in line with the last couple comments. Uh, $23 million is a lot of money, uh, and DIVA will pay $15.4 million of that. <laughs> Medicare will pay $7.9 million. Actually, it's $24 million because MVP is going to be paying one care, one million. Um, so taxpayers might not like the idea with regard to DIVA paying $15.4 million. Uh, taxpayers might not like the idea of the state giving this large sum of money, 15.4 million, to uh, a private entity. And they might, in fact, uh, instead prefer that these health care savings accrue to the state. Um, that's actually an option because DIVA on January 1st will become a state run risk bearing Medicaid managed care organization. And in under that scenario, the savings would instead accrue to the state in the public's best interest. So um, we're talking about a lot of money here. And um, as former uh, public comments made, these are really the public's dollars. And yet um, we're giving 24 million of it uh, to a private entity and the state is not realizing the savings. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think we uh, understand the point pretty clearly. Um, Robert Hoffman. Yeah, I just want to also underscore um, if if folks think that the legislature isn't catching on to this, they don't see the little trickery that's happening. You folks are sorely mistaken. There is a growing storm inside the legislature that's getting prepared to make big changes because this is not working. And frankly, there are going to be studies coming out in the near future. There's enough data that's accrued at this point that's going to clearly link the all payers capitation and global budgets and the lack of any demonstration of improvement projects to the limited access to care, increased morbidity and increased mortality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? If not, I'd like to thank all our presenters this afternoon. It was a great conversation, um, especially uh, heartening to see uh, MVP as part of this conversation today. And um, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone, especially Michelle and Sarah. Sarah. And um, is there any 
old business to come before the board at this time. Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board at this time? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. It's been moved. Second. It's been moved by Member Holmes and seconded by Member Pelham to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying aye. By saying Thank you everyone, have a great rest of the day. And as Susan said earlier, we hope that uh, everyone has a, a really uh, great Thanksgiving and gets to spend some time with family and friends. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody.